knee surgeries later. We're still trying to get that figured out in three years later. So the past few years, I've been kind of dabbling and uh, looking into a bunch of things, some decision making, and just really learning more about avalanches than I did probably in the previous 10 years. It's been a kind of unique opportunity to speak to a lot of interesting people who know a lot more than I do. So what I'm going to talk to you here, or talk to you guys about today, uh, trollers caught in an explosives triggered avalanche is kind of a really unique subset of a surprise avalanche and not really a post control release thing. Uh, first, uh, some quick acknowledgments. Bob Coey from Jackson, Martin Summers at Solitude, Well Tone at Squaw Valley, and Larry Haywood helped me out by uh, openly discussing the fatalities that involved ski patrollers caught in slides. And it's not an easy thing to do to be transparent about someone who's working with you or for you getting killed. And then thanks to Bob Dixon, I was hoping he could be here, but he had big sky management for uh, giving me the freedom to share some information from past events up there down the road. And then thanks to John Young and Young's Doug Allen Light and Mike Piat for some good discussions over the years on this topic. So some sobering statistics. There have been 41 professionals, this is not including uh, Wolf Creek this year, I didn't update it. Um, 41 professionals have died in ski area accidents in the U.S. 1958 to 83, there were 12, and I'm not going to worry about what happened before that. But there were no artificially explosive triggered events. So when patrollers or forecasters, avalanche professionals were killed in an avalanche, there was a trigger of explosives. So none of them between 58 and 83. Then 84 to 95, there were seven fatalities. Um, and three of them, which all happened in one event down in Colorado, were uh, killed in an explosive triggered avalanche. So we're starting to see some there come onto the map in the 80s. Then 96 to 2009, there were three um, ski area workers killed in avalanches, and all of them were killed in explosive triggered events. So it's probably not statistic statistically significant, but if nothing else, it's a, a bad trend that you see right there, that this is what's happening to people when they get killed at work in avalanches recently. Wolf Creek uh, you know, broke that trend. That was not an explosive trigger slide. He was just on skis one this year. So what I'm going to try to do mainly is get people thinking. I'm not going to have the answers to anything. Hopefully I'll create more questions than answer things. And uh, towards the end, I'm going to give you some, some things to take home and uh, think about. Hopefully you'll talk to me about it too because it's some stuff I'm really interested in. We'll look at six case histories, three fatalities, and three things that happened in Big Sky. And then we'll talk a little bit about why are these happening. And I'll ask you that too, and then I'll show you what I have, some my uh, way of kind of bringing it together, some things that I've noticed. And then I'll talk a little bit about some ideas that, that I have on uh, what we might be able to do to prevent. And this is, uh, it's not the end all, like I said, it's just some things that I'll throw out there to this group. So please ask questions, raise your hand during it, and I'll uh, stop a few times and say, okay, does that make sense? Because we're going to do like a whirlwind. Cliff Notes version of all these different accidents so we can get through it and try to examine them a little bit. While we're looking at them, kind of think of it in terms of the avalanche triangle. So snowpack, weather, terrain, with decision making, human factors in the middle, then also think about the avalanche characteristics with each of these little events. So 1996 in solitude, down in Big Cottonwood Canyon, down in the Wasatch, uh, an area called the Honeycomb area. Some people here are probably familiar with it. At that point, it was never open to ski in public. Honeycomb Canyon wasn't. So they did control stuff down below. There were some runs down in the bottom of the basin that were open. Uh, it was an unusually dry year through January 14th. So before, up to that point, they didn't have enough snow to go in there and travel around and even worry about looking around. And then they got too much snow too fast, 14 feet in 14 days in the second half of the year, right? Just like Montana, right? <laughs> um, they hadn't done any work, like I said, yet that season. And then once it started snowing, they were getting too much snow. They didn't want to go in there while it was in the middle of that storm. And they had their, their hands full dealing with the imbalance train that they were opening to ski a public. <coughs> so like, during that storm, 80% of the honeycomb area ran naturally, relative class 3, class 4s during the storm. And about 65% of the boundaries area, which is what we're looking at, a specific area of the honeycomb um, section, ran naturally on January 26th. So then on February 2nd, they went up to do the, the 
control work in this area, and it was, uh, use my cheater notes here a little bit when I have to. Eight degrees Fahrenheit, so pretty cool, overcast, light winds. The storm had been done with for two days, so it had about 48 hours to kind of settle out. This isn't, this is just a shock, um, shock price when you know Avalanche Atlas type photo showing the whole area. Um, on the route, just going along, throwing shots and kicking corners. They got 20 class twos, relative class twos, and a few, two class threes that day. And then they entered this area. Um, Jeff Brewer was the guy that was killed, and his partner Eric. They entered this area, and they're working from this way going down now. Through shot in 32, you can see right now there's some wires there. Those were not there at that time. They're there as a result of this accident, basically. So they threw a shot into 32, didn't get any result there, went down to 33, and Dank was shot on a tree somewhere down in this area. And then they weren't standing on the ridge though, they, and this is the standard, which you know back then that's how they did it because it had worked for them up till that point. They would stay on these little thinner areas and on these subtle ribs. So they were standing on a 47 degree slope with one guy right below a tree, one guy right above a tree, when the shot went off just a little bit down below. Um, shot went off, so you can see the rough area. They were probably on, uh, it's hard to tell, probably on one of these little trees right here in this subtle rib, a really steep area, dangling shot somewhere else down in, in these trees. Shot went off, uh, two to six foot deep crown. It ended up being 1,600 feet wide once it got down a little bit, so a really wide avalanche, uh, 1,000 vertical feet, and like I said, a 47 degree slow angle, hard slab, and the Jeff Brewer was killed in that accident. So any questions on the solitude one? Were they both caught? So one guy managed to hang onto the tree, broke up above him. You were, did you know Jeff from your old business? Moving on to Squaw Valley. Um, I think Doug alluded to this one, Andrew Hinton. Accident on March 3rd, 2009. This is the headwall area at Squaw. And uh, you can see it's a kind of subalpine, alpine area. Obviously, really exposed to wind and weather. And a little closer look, zooming in at the headwall area and the, the accident that day. They had received, this isn't the, the picture of, what, of the day that it happened, but they had received about a little over four feet of snow in the previous 24 hours. It was still storming, still blowing really hard, so mid-storm. I think like it was over 100 mile an hour winds on the Sierra Crest during the storm. So terrible weather, terrible news, and definitely storm in progress. In March there, there uh, most of the information I got on this was from Well Town, and uh, Doug, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there, to her knowledge, there was not any persistent weak layer that she couldn't recall if it was a, on the old snow interface or within the storm with that one. They may not have even Known because it snowed so much and continued blowing after the accident that I don't know if they could even tell. Um, so J and A, Jeremy and Andrew, that's their, their initial position when they start the route there. And it's it's a little deceiving. It looks like, wow, you're kidding me, you'd stand there. But that's actually a you know a reasonable place to stand. They haven't had accidents and they still haven't standing there. It's uh, not ideal as far as a perfect safe spot. But that's where they start the route together. Threw a couple shots down there, no results. And then Jeremy moves over this one and throws two more shots down into the, kind of on that whale there, down in the roller in the headwall area. So now he's over there, and Andrew's still up above. At this point, they can't see each other due to visibility. It's really poor. It's unknown exactly where Andrew ended up. He did move. They don't know if. If he decided, I can't see my partner, I need to move, if it was just the vertigo that he didn't like where he was and decided, I don't know, I gotta go somewhere else. But he definitely moved down, just based on where the crown was and the fact that he was caught. At that point, Jeremy threw two more shots down below. Down there, which proceeded to take out all the craters from the previous control work and take Andrew with it down in the, in the avalanche when he was Partially buried, killed by trauma during the ride. He had been working there for nine years prior, and this was his his route. So he had a lot of experience with the area. It wasn't like they threw someone there on, a, on an oddball whim on a, on a really bad day. That wasn't the case at all. Any 
questions on that one? Or do you have anything to add? Because you are going to go away from all of this, right? So Jackson Hole, January 2010, the big Wally or Wally incident. Um, a little bit on the history there. They have real shallow snowpack through mid-December, 19 inches of depth floor and three inches of new snow on December 11th. Intermittent storms and dry spells through January 5th, so a real prominent crust facet kind of snowpack with a bunch of crap down below it underneath. The area that happened Route 7 was run several times, but it was too thin to open, so they hadn't had any skiers yet on the slope. Um, January 5th, 6th, they got 10 inches, kind of really dense snow, a little uh, unusual for that time of the year if we're down there. Inch and a half of water with 30, 60 mile an hour winds, and kind of seasonal temps. And that obviously got a good cycle going. On the day it happened, they had rated things, I can't remember, I think high, and they actually rate within the ski area, they issued a forecast rating. And they were expecting um, releases in the old layers, so it wasn't a surprise, the fact that they were getting, they were expecting to get avalanches, and they did get avalanches. The story, um, the way they do this route, the Cheyenne Bowl area, come down from the road, typically they'll get out of their skis, one person will, and throw a shot down as far as they can. And a lot of this information actually that I got here came from Mike Ream and Bob Comey. He said that that day he didn't get out of his skis, they don't really know why, to, to throw the shot, so it probably didn't go as far, and he'd been kind of having shoulder trouble. So he, it probably didn't go as far as some other people might have thrown it. Um, they were the first ones to admit, and they wanted me to impress upon people that that being said, if that's what you're dependent on, then you need to have, be able to get out of your skis, get a good wind-up, and have a good arm, that you're probably not leaving yourselves a lot of margin for safety with uh, a design like that with the program. Um, so they threw a shot down there, no result. I think actually two, well, I threw one from the road, and then uh, Two of them cut the path, moved together at that point down, they felt they were safe down to where the shot was, kind of somewhere in this area, around where the arrow is. One person kind of going over this way, one person kind of going over this way, which was Wally. And at that point, he didn't like what he felt, it was really thin and rotten, so I'm going to throw a couple shots, so he threw a couple more down below, kind of out in this area, from where he was standing. And they hung out then, standing right around the crater from that other shot, figuring out that that's a safe zone. So they're standing down in this area here. The shot went off, broke 90 feet above them. They were both initially caught. The one partner was able to grab a tree, but Big Wally ended up taking the full ride and was buried down there and was killed in the avalanche. Um, do you have, you've <coughs> investigated this, I'm sure you have anything to add about that event down there? Is, sorry, is the, yeah. Was the original picture you showed looking up the path of um, yes. Was that in this last photo? The because it seemed like there was two areas that kind of pulled out. But maybe on. it's it's one, and then there's another that where you can see kind of flanks over. That would be just out of sight over on this side. <coughs> I think is what you're talking about. So this is looking up just from below that cliff band, just above where he was buried. Right. Okay. Yeah. So lookers left, skiers right. So that picture is taken areas. from kind of down in here. Okay. Right. Because it looks like over to the right, there's another yes. area where, or to the right of the slide, almost off the frame. It looks, I was wondering whether it was that area there. Skiers right or skiers? Uh, lookers right. So over in here? Yeah, or this cliff's just to the right of where you are. Oh, over, over here, okay. Yeah. No, it was, it was it's looking in that area. Okay. You can't really see those cliffs, they're on the other side of those trees, right. so okay. it's a little skewed at the angle. So the avalanche, 41 degree slope, east northeast, three feet deep. With deeper flanks, it kind of blows downhill there over that convexity and collects in down below the cliff, so that's why there was so much debris. Not as wide, but still fairly good propagation, 150 feet plus, even very vertical. And it fell on a thin layer of two to four millimeter facets sitting on top of a crust down on our whole icy wet surface. Questions on that one? Yeah, It's not really a question, Mark. More of a comment that these these incidents um, just kind of really remind you to exercise your forecasting skills as much as possible. 
<clears throat> like if you, when you have strange situations like, you know, persistent depth or nine inches of depth or on the ground or, you know, four feet of fresh snow or 14 feet of snow in 14 days, you'll really be thinking, you know, thinking outside the box a little bit other than your just kind of standard routine. Thing. Yep. Really try to focus on how am I going to be to play this as safe as possible. And That's awesome. You're going to like what I have later. Want to talk later. <laughs> really good points. You need to pay attention to those, you know, clue in, you know, recognize that this is different. I need to act appropriately rather than, you know, you can't do things the way that you would all the other times. So think about these things. We won't go through it, but snowpack, weather, terrain, avalanche characteristics, human factors, just like what Eric was saying there. Think about the red flags and not uh, keep rolling there. So big sky, for those of you that haven't been around there, the we'll picture a little mountain here with the bowl area, challenger area, what we call the upper cirque, and the south face. And we'll have kind of all areas represented with the three events. This is the south face with the greater Lenin area, the Stutzman's Bowl, and the greater Hanging Valley, Kircher's Cliffs. Um, Moving here. So the first one that I'll get into is uh, Alert, Little Rock Tongue. You can read about this one in the Snowy Torrents, um, 1982. Alert area on Challenger. It's this trees here. This would be Big Rock Tongue. That's Little Rock Tongue. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, this would be facing the east. So this is kind of east, southeast, southeast. As you wrap around the corner over here, it's south. But where it happened is kind of more of an east, southeast area. Uh, Subalpine, it's not on a ridge, it gets some wind loading, but it tends to be more cross loading than, uh, than some of the more exposed areas that we've seen in the last couple of incidents. So, the scenario early November snows, kind of it was normal ish until about November 14th, followed by a dry spell and cold temps. So, really thin, fast, early season pack. And then, uh, so early December storms, you got about 16 inches in the first few days of December with some moderate winds, uh, fairly low density snow also, nothing real exceptional. And the one thing that I will hit upon is uh, the inexperienced patrol being a really factor here. These guys look like they're, they're, they have some life experiences, <laughs> but as far as ski patrol, <laughs> maybe not as much. That year is, uh, is interesting. The year before, there was a big labor strife. And uh, in the snow safety office, I'm sure it's still up there, I've been there in a while, but we have all these written records that they hand draw of all the snow, all these graphs. And you get up there, and for 1980-81, or no, 81-82, it just says, the missing year. So basically the whole patrol quit, or was fired, partway through that year, and there is no data for that year. That's when the dirtbag ball came to Bridger Bowl. So they didn't have one of big sky, so the whole patrol quit. Right, Randy? <laughs> a lot of history. Steve did it back then. But uh, that left two people working there who had worked at Big Sky before. Yance, who they asked him to be the snow safety director, and he said, I have I've only worked here for five years. I have no interest in that at all. He was smart enough to recognize that. And then Doug Kramer, who unfortunately wasn't, he said, sure, I'll do it. So he was the, the snow safety director. Sean Monahan was the patrol director. He was fresh out of the program in Wenatchee, had never patrolled or seen Big Sky before, and he was a patrol director that year. Bob Dixon, he was a rookie patroller along with four or five other rookies, and uh, so all this stuff happened on their first and second days of work. There was no preseason training. 1981, it's a different environment back then, but this is an especially different year in a different era. I would say, in an interesting place. So there are a lot of, you know, that you can't talk about this incident without that backdrop of, you know, a complete lack of experience and some huge operational issues back then. So it happened opening day also. And they didn't come in, there were no shots thrown anywhere on the mountain prior to that day. It was all their first day of work. They had done a little bit of poking around, digging some pits back in, uh, like, mid-November, Young's had, but that was it. So December 7th, this is the precursor, another incident of post-control release where a member of the public kicked this off, was dragged down, and ended up breaking his femur, David Kelleher did. They 
they did a control work up in uh, this area, got some results. They didn't get anything up at this level. This slide was after the fact. And this slide was after the fact, after they saw this and decided to shut the bowl and do a second lap. So that was the day before um, the event alert. They hadn't gone over to Challenger yet. There was no lift over there. It was a hike to area. This happened, and then they decided, okay, next day we'll go over and let's try out Challenger and see what happens over there, which I asked Bob about that. He's like, yeah, I don't know the decision that was. It's you know, interesting to say the least. So the next day they head over to Alert, and it's a three-person route. Uh, Bob Dixon, on uh, his second day at work, then Monahan, who at this point still never thrown a shot anywhere, and uh, Kramer, who is the snow safety director. So the three of them worked their way across coming from this way, doing kind of a gain traverse. And uh, they got three or four slides to go to the ground on the way over, including one uh, 150 feet sympathetic slide that went from pretty much all the little gullies over there. They got to this point and got a big settlement in a little tree, then kind of, this is a really big snow here, so there are some rock areas that are safe up here, and this is marginally an avalanche path. So it was fairly reasonable still at this point what they had going. They were going up to try to get to this area to deal with these starting zones up in here by going up that way. Didn't get any results in there. Came back down while well, a couple of them were still hanging out up kind of in the rocks up there. Bob Dixon came back down, z down through his bikini patch a little bit, z down through Onslow's end. And uh, they had thrown a shot at Onslow's while they were working over but hadn't dealt with zucchini patch. He was going to wait on this is a prominent rock rib here early season between Onslow's and Zucchini Patch, even though the snow is connected up above. Um, then Monahan and Kramer came back down while Bob was around here. They got to there, one of them tucked in this area, and Kramer did a little bit uphill of Bob. Monahan was in this area, tried to throw a shot out there, got hung up on a tree, fell down onto the ground like 10 feet away from him. <coughs> so they decided, well, we got to get out of here now. Monaghan and Kramer started traversing across Onslow's together. The whole thing settled and ripped. Onslow's did and pulled a little bit over into zucchini patch. It did not take the burning shot down with it. Luckily, that stayed apart. So we caught all three of them. They were all in a row. Uh, starting on for the ride, Monaghan didn't get, or uh, excuse me, Kramer was able to grab onto a tree, hang onto a tree. The other two guys were both buried. He found um, Dixon pretty quickly. Um, opened up, dug him up to the point where he had an airway, and then at that point Yunz was showing up. Yunz dug Dixon out the rest of the way. He went and found uh, Monahan, dug him up. He was kind of in, in rough situation, you know, starting to lose consciousness at that point, but dug him up and he was okay. So really close call, you know, a really great rescue, but a lot of interesting things going on. The avalanche was uh, filled on, you know, on facets two to three feet deep, uh, about 100 feet across, not a huge slide. Questions on that? Talk so about the one was on a rock rib? Was yeah. He moving too, or was he, What's that? Was he moving too when, when he got swept? He, he was, he was not. He was, he was standing there waiting while they were moving. And he was, <coughs> I talked to Bob a couple nights about this, a couple nights ago. He was going to stay there until they got done moving and then get out of the way after they had moved over somewhere over in this area, hopefully. Trying to get to basically to the rock, to a crowd, was the plan. So why does a big sky have the reputation it's had? <laughs> what reputation is that? <laughs> Biggest ski in America. <laughs> so, uh, the Lennon Shedmore incident, we'll move up. <coughs> we'll one with the 80s, one of the 90s, one of the 2000s. The big sky. So a little bit real briefly, uh, 1974 to 93 in the South Base, which is this area, was passive forecasting, some observations, and throwing a few test shots, and effectively going on field trips over there. Not a real active research and development program. It was, we'll go up there when we get the chance, when we have the opportunity. Then 94, 95 season, it was active. We're trying to do every day, and that didn't quite work out due to hiking up and then going across this area. You'd still, well, there's a rope toe at that point. But um, it was still kind of, you know, if anything happened to you out there, you're in the backcountry in the middle of nowhere, there's no rescue. So it's, it was an interesting situation to be doing, you know, full-on storm in progress and really real terrain, doing active 
mitigation work in the middle of the day with no really good answer for backup. So it was active, but it still wasn't a, it wasn't like to an operational extent, if that makes sense. And then the tram opened December 1995, and no deep slab slides in the 95-96 season. There was over 100 inches in October at the below tree line, Lobo Weather site, which just doesn't happen very often. It's not a little cottonwood canyon around here. So that was probably the worst thing that happened as far as, uh, you know, boy, this is great. Nothing bad's going to happen up here. That first year was just these snow avalanches. So 1996, got a really good rain crust sitting. So early season snow, a kind of typical setup where it snows, it blows around, you get this rock hard wind slab that covers up a lot of the rocks and then it'll rain on it or get sunny. And this was a, just like Jordy was talking about in crampons, it was blue and gray. And you did not want to walk around on this thing after the, after the several avalanches that failed on it. Then cool and heavy snowfall after that. It was a really big winter, 96, 97, all through the northern and central Rockies. It was the biggest year in the last 30, 40 years, I think. December 9th, Lenin, first dictator, and second dictator race slip. This is, isn't from that year, but it gives you a good idea of the extent of that crown. So those paths all went together on December 9th, failing on the facets above that ice crust. And then sustained snow and wind for most of October. And then December 25th, a couple of key things happened. First of all, uh, Yance was a snow safety director at that point. There was no snow safety department. He was the snow safety director though. And he was going to get shots in the morning and squatted down and then stood back up and shredded all the cartilage in his knee. So he was done that morning on Christmas morning. Which I didn't realize that until I talked to him about a week ago. That's exactly how it happened. So he was dispatched. Couldn't go do his route. Another one of the supervisors didn't show up for work and ultimately quit that day, didn't show up. So the route schedule got juggled and ended up having an explosive fatality on the summit on Christmas morning. That was when Erica Pankow was killed. When that happened, routes were abandoned and it was a storm in progress, you know, a big, almost Utah-style load. There was well over a foot of snow, like 16 or 18 inches down below a tree line from that storm with you know, well over two feet on the upper mountain with 30 to 60 mile an hour west southwest winds. Pretty cool times also. So there's kind of the, the weather on the 25th, 26th. So on the 26th then, we came back in, there's a you know a big load obviously waiting for us that day. Terrible visibility, maybe uh, Mike and I were both up there, we estimated five to 50 feet, about as bad as it gets on the upper stretches of the mountain. Really hard to communicate, you can't hear a radio really well when it's blowing that hard no matter how well you, um, you try. And there are two routes, to, at that point it's called the Lennon Bridge, the bridge down here, and uh, the Lennon Route, or Lennon Low, you don't know what exactly, we call it just the Lennon Route. For that day, for whatever reason, the, the Lennon Low Route, which I was on, went out kind of as normal, but we were going to be responsible for more terrain, and the Lennon Bridge Route was going to come in around the horn here through Stutzman's Bowl and pop it down here rather than dealing with that side. Um, so just changing things up the day that, that the event happened. Uh, real quick narrative on it. I came down, I had two other route partners, came down to here. This is a snow fence and it was there's a lot more snow and the, the snow fence is about half buried. So I went down the bottom of that and tied in, threw a shot to the left, shot straight below, shot out here to the right. This is the way that usually the wet and bridge route would come down through here. Instead, they popped in about the level that I'm at right there. Uh, those shots didn't get any results. You just kind of heard some, it sounded like popcorn going off. You couldn't really tell what was going on. It looked a lot different than the day before with the big winds. It, obviously, a big rapid load, uh, really hard slab. At that point, I moved down to this fence here, kind of picked my way down over the other side there. My route partners came down into this area by these rocks, which are called the little gullies, and one of them decided to throw a shot through it kind of down below them, and somewhere in this area, hard to say. Um, they both heard, at that point, Mike and his partner were out in uh, Lennon, so this is where that, the route that threw the, or the guys that threw the shot were standing right here. They were kind of out in this area, Mike was somewhere over on the ridge, his partner was somewhere out here, and he heard the shot get called in, 
and he knew it, so he was trying to set, step back up and get back on the ridge, figuring I'll get back up to 400. Right before it went off, he, uh, he recalls saying, no, because he saw Mike starting to walk out, he thought, or saw him in a spot where he's like, don't, don't look at me, and it went off, and uh, we had no idea that there was anyone else out there, that those guys were anywhere but standing on rocks, you know, a really, really scary situation. So it went off, and uh, this is roughly where, where Mike probably was, and Rich, the other guy, was somewhere up in here trying to regain this ridge. Um, the shot was around there, it ended up breaking about a thousand feet across by the time it was all said and done. Uh, five to nine feet deep, ran 1,800 vertical feet. I'll give you a little um, verbal description. I don't remember hearing the shot go off. I remember it was a crack shooting either right behind or between Rich's legs and right behind my skis and then free falling. I can still see Rich facing me in a perfect skier stance as though he were casually traversing a ski slope, only we were falling straight down through space. I remember pushing large blocks of snow away from me as we fell, and I remember landing on the bed surface on my skis, red, white, and yellow on the line and sweet skis at the time. And the tail of my downhill ski punching through a crust and me standing on an icy, very steep slope with my ski kind of quivering out in front of me. For some reason, Wiley Coyote comes to mind, free falling and catching a tree or something, and it kind of twang, boing, before he drops another thousand feet onto the canyon floor. Only we stuck, both of us. I remember Rich kind of weasel his way over to me on that slick, icy bed surface to sort of grab my arm and just sort of staring at me. So, really close call. I basically, free fell off that cornice onto the ice. They were probably two, three feet or not, it would have been really hard to stop. And might end up down there. That's where the lift shack used to be. The slide ended up taking off the lift. Um, the top of the, the shack and throwing it into the top few towers. Kind of wrecked the lift for about a month. It took them a while to face the cars. That's the avalanche burn, which has since been straight. It was at much too normal an angle. And it's also been increased in size, but it's still marginally effective. It stops the slides that don't really matter, that they wouldn't damage left anyhow, but when we get the really big one, it'll be interesting to see what happens. It doesn't, it deflects things to a certain extent. Questions on that one? So in 2003, um, I'll try to go quicker and pick it up. It's lingering October snow at upper elevations kind of dry and cool, so thin fast with snowpack early December, and then just kind of steady loading, um, wintry, blustery conditions 6th through the 15th. Nothing here to allow like 4 inches of snow, 3 inches of snow, 8 inches of snow, 2 inches of snow, 3 inches, with steady like 30 to 50 mile an hour winds throughout most of the period. Um, first good indicators, like Eric was saying, some surprises are good. We showed up to work on the sun after, right at the beginning of that loading period. And that's a typical ground slide. You don't see them that much to the ground that often. So that was natural. It happened at night with a few inches of snow. And led to the most uh, condensed, widespread, complete cycle that we've seen there, I think mean, still to date. It was both sides of the ridge in an eight-day period. Pretty much every path on that mountain, there's one little sliver of snow there that didn't go, but that's about it. Otherwise, everything went. Some really dramatic propagation events, too, over the Challenger area. The shot here triggered an avalanche over in this area, which is where the person was hiding a few feet away from where the, the flank ended up being. And that area had never seen a slide before in the uh, big sky history, which is only since 1974. It also cracked some areas in here and triggered this. So it's really good propagation from that one shot, in addition to triggering this stuff. This shot, this is taken the day after, you can still faintly see the, the uh, powder mark there because it's not an inch or so overnight. But that shot didn't trigger anything right there. It triggered slide there, down uh, here you can't see, there and there. So it took out four separate avalanches. So some really good propagation. That's in the blurred area where uh, this is the little tree path. That would be Anzalus and that would be Zucchini Batch. So this is where the three people were caught in that previous event back in the 80s. Um, this is then that same year. This is a, I wish we would have measured this. We didn't have one bigger slide. Can't really see that much for scale there, but that's Bart who's in the room. And Chabot is actually up there for this day. So it's like he's standing right there. That's like a seven foot crown there. We never measured that, but it had to be at least 15 feet. It would have been nice to put a tape over it at some point. 
And then when uh, Shabo and I actually, when we were heading out, we were, bar, we were heading out, we are out on the far end of this ridge and got this really nice collapse. And, boom, and then kind of cruising across and you see the, the debris starting to trickle down as we're still going across the hill, getting close to where we're going to throw one of these shots in there. So a nice like 400, 500 foot away, remotely triggered slide there. Um, then Kranz, that's all in the few days before this incident up here in Kranz, is an upper cirque tucked in there. So a little bit below the ridge line. Access it this way from the side. It's kind of a tough access. This would be the Dobie slide path, and this is Kranz. Dobies had slid once previously in 1999, which had killed a person, and that area of the mountain was closed. The, just the lower mountain, groomers were open, and they violated the closures, hiked up, and were traversing across it to go ski the big cool water over here, went popped and killed the guy in that terrain trap. But this area here had never slid on oh, old snow, persistent weak layers in the, at that point, 30 year history of the ski area. So the patroller <laughs> headed in off the ridge, got to the rocks here, threw a double out in that area. Usually they would, if you throw that shot there, you traverse back over to a safe spot underneath rocks here. He decided he wasn't going to do that. I'm not sure why he felt comfortable with where it was. Part of this path had already slid over in this area, deep, but not, uh, not in this area or on that side. He was decided he was too close to the shot, so I stepped up to position number two, and I did the investigation on it. You can actually see where his where the tips of his skis were. You can still see the tracks. It was just the, the tails <coughs> that were affected the, by the uh, avalanche, which was able to kind of sweep him off his little perch in the rocks there and take him down. Um, he was incredibly lucky. <coughs> Six foot deep crown, 300 feet wide, hard slab, 400 vertical feet. Uh, 36 to 44 degrees at the starting, at the, yeah, the starting zone of the ground, one to three millimeter facets sitting on top of the barrel. He's nice cross the floor right on the ground. And he was buried right there. You can see he blew through. He got really lucky that it was as big a slide as it was because he blew through this train trap. He was buried two and a half feet deep. His head was two and a half feet deep in the area where the debris was 12 feet deep right there. There's pulling him out, and there's one happy guy afterwards. <clears throat> Questions on that one? Isn't that the same slope where a guy died Thanksgiving Day? And it is. That's the one in 99, yeah. 99. Jack. Yeah. Yep. He was in the Dobie side of it when he got, which was the, the side that the shot was thrown onto. So, this is where we, we use our expert skills. <laughs> We are all experts. <laughs> Got to wake up and up real quick. Remember we got there? That's true, too. <laughs> That's great. So, terrain. Going back to looking at the avalanche triangle, thinking about what, what kind of things stand out over the red flags. This is what I came up with. Is there anything else out there? I mean, we saw alpine and subalpine areas, but tended to not be down below a tree line. Part of that's you know, a big sky due to the terrain, but also at the other ski areas too. We just we haven't seen them. Uh, they all tended to be steeper paths. It wasn't people getting tricked on 32, 33 degree stubborn angles. And they were fairly open areas. They tended to not be tight little shoots, tight little trees. They tended to be wide, wide open, more exposed. Any other terrain observations? So weather. Bad viz is definitely a factor in a few of them. Large storms, a couple of them were kind of historically large storms. I'd say the, the solitude event definitely was. And the, uh, the big sky south face one was a, you know, a pretty big, huge, rapid load. But a lot of times, these events, it wasn't this huge, huge storm right away. It was you know, maybe a sneaky cumulative load. Like the Jackson Hole, it, it was a big load, but not like, wow, that's the biggest storm we've seen in 15 years. So it, I don't think that it necessarily has to be the, the huge storm that triggers the, well, i got to watch out, something's different about this. Snowpack, some really common similarities. I think uh, all but the Squaw Valley one involved facets. Even, I mean, the big sky ones are skewed on the south face because you're always going to, almost always going to have crust there. But Jackson Hole, east, northeast, that had a crust. Solitude's a little bit unknown. Crusts were definitely a factor in, in a fair amount of these. Um, hard slabs, predominantly. 
and ski compaction. Some of them were ski compacted, some of them were. The one in uh, Kranz, I didn't say, but that slope had not been open to the public yet at that point. So there, were, there was no ski compaction there. Squaw Valley, yes, obviously in March on a popular ski run. And then avalanche characteristics. They weren't necessarily all these huge R5, like, wow, that was the biggest thing I've seen. But a lot of them involved a large surface area. They were wider than normal, and especially they pulled higher than normal. That was probably the one common factor. They tended to pull higher than, than usual. The one at Jackson, the one at Lurt. They, uh, really all of them, pulled out higher than they usually do. Dramatic propagation, whether it was in that event or preceding events, that was often associated with these. And then the, the, I haven't seen that before factor, or the operational or institutional memory that, uh, that Jordy was talking about. One thing that I think we really need to watch out for as an industry, our oper operational memory, it's really short. I mean, 40 years is a blip. Let's say a lot of these events, maybe they're you know once every 25 years return period, just throw that number out there. What do you think the chances of seeing, if you assume that that's a 25 year event, what do you think the chances are that you'll see a 25 year event happen in any 10 year period? Thirty three percent. Not very good. What do you think the chances are that you'll see a, a twenty five year event happen in a twenty five year period? Two thirds of the time, so sixty six percent. Pretty good chances, but still far from great. What do you think the chances? A lot of the skiers around here now tend to have roughly a forty year operational history. What do you think the chances that you'll see a twenty five year event happen in a, any forty year period? It's only 80%, so 20% of the time in any 40 year period, you're not going to see those 25 year events. So really, after another couple hundred years, we should have a pretty good handle on it. But right now, uh, well, I've never seen that happen before. I mean, I hate to say it, but a lot of times it doesn't mean shit. Is that, it's a sad but truth, I, I think. And, uh, on, on the other hand, you know, you have to respect that operational institutional memory because even though we do only have 40 years, it is 40 years, it's not two years or something like that. So it, it is worthwhile for sure to respect the, the operational and institutional memory, but don't put too much weight in it. I just say be leery of it a little bit. Um, human factors, and I'll touch on that a little bit more on, with a little crossover thing here in a second. So the familiarity, heuristic, distractions, mainly the weather. Communications played a big role in a few of these that people couldn't hear very well or couldn't see their partner, couldn't talk to them. And operational planning, obviously with the the um, initial Big Sky incident. I mean, that's just, don't know what to say about that. Yeah, sure. The other, the other one that seems pretty consistent to most accident investigations is that it's often a cascade of events too. Yep. There's, there's not one factor that often causes it. It's that combination of this happened, and then this happened, and then because of that, this happened at any one of those points, they could have pulled out by making a different decision, but you're sort of in this, this cascade of disaster. Yeah. And the example you gave before was really interesting, and in, um, I can't remember where I was, but the guy who had the, the arm couldn't throw the shot as far as he normally could. And Jackson. You know, and Jackson needed, really, they needed to throw it a little bit further. Yeah. So you're kind of setting yourself up for failure there straight away. Yeah, it, it is really interesting how many times that happens where you start going down a slippery slope and at any point you can break that chain and avoid accidents with hindsight in 2020. So how might we reduce these things going forward? Well, safety margins, so you know, safety margins 101. What is a safety margin? It's basically how much can you screw up for both humans and can the system or your equipment screw up before you have an accident? And that, that amount that you can screw up before we have an accident, this is just a, a graph about pilots um, you know, during different parts of flight. But uh, safety margins are really important. When uh, I got to spend some time with a guy, Jim Riley, he's a really intelligent guy who's a PhD geologist and the dean of an online university, and he's a space shuttle commander who flew on three missions in addition to flying F 17s for the Navy for however many years. So I spent like a day and a half with this conference down in Colorado and uh, learned a lot. With uh, aircraft safety margins, one thing that he didn't really hit home for me was when people are designing commercial aircraft, they tend to have about 
safety margin. So those planes are built to withstand forces that are roughly twice what they would expect to encounter in the worst possible conditions. Then you bump it up to high-end military aircraft, like these guys landed out in the South Pacific on an aircraft carrier. There it's about 30%, worst possible conditions. There's still a 30% safety margin with the equipment. Then on the shuttle, it's 10%. So they have a 10% safety margin. It's really narrowing. And that's what um, I want to hit on here, these narrow margin environments. Um, it's really imperative to recognize when our safety margins are compressing, when they're contracting like that. And there aren't going to be flashing neon signs that say danger, danger, danger. But in a way, there are. In some of the things we were just looking at, we really need more data. I mean, everyone needs to give Carl our data and hopefully we can get something else going on, on more of these surprise avalanches to figure out what are the common factors so we can figure out, all right, we are in a situation here where we can't mess up because the consequences are going to be more severe, it's going to be easier to mess up. When you run into these narrow margin environments, some of the things that Jim um, impresses upon people, he does a lot of corporate training too, missed details can kill you that you really need to pay attention to all the little details and spend some time just thinking. Make sure that you don't spend all your time doing, spend some time thinking when you're in these environments. Question everything. So look at your, your plan and if you're thinking, well, why something just doesn't seem right, but question everything about it. You know, start with the very basics. It's like, am I wearing the right boots? Go that deep to make sure that nothing happens to you. Act like everybody has your life in their hands and you have theirs. Where you really need to uh, don't be afraid to step in and say, you know what, I don't like the way this is going. You can't be afraid to say something about it, just like Jory said. You know, break that chain, that cascade, while it's before it reaches the, the uh, critical point where you have an accident. Schedules are really guidelines that it's just imperative when, you know, we're going to have goals. Okay, we really want to open this today. But when you're in those situations, it's just a guideline. You can't have, let it be a goal. You can't let the schedules be goals. And then stop cards. That if someone is on a team that's operating in these narrow margin environments, you really need to make sure that everyone has a stop card that they can play. And what that means is they can say, all right, time out. We've got to stop what we're doing. I don't like this. And they're allowed to do that. You can't say, no, nah, you're going to keep going. We'll talk about it later. Not everyone has a go card saying we're going to keep moving. The, the team leaders or certain people are going to have those go cards. But everyone on these teams needs to have a stop card and be able to say, I don't like this, I'm not going for it. So, uh, difficulties in the athletic world. In a narrow margin environment, right? What could possibly go wrong there? I'm almost down here, where are we? So how do we recognize the narrow margin in situations? Like I said, there aren't going to be flashing signs out there. Uh, it's a tough situation, but hopefully we do get enough information that we can, uh, going forward with these weird events, that we can develop a way to, to recognize it more, more quickly and more accurately. Um, another thing that Jim Riley preached was come up with your plan and in the morning, and then you brief on your plan. You talk about what you're going to do, and you execute it, and then you debrief. And I think, you know, guide meetings and heli guides, they tend to have a lot of afternoon and evening guide meetings. But ski area workers, we don't do that. I don't know if, do you guys do that at Forecast Center? Do you do much, like, afternoon or evening meetings where you debrief stuff? No, we're rarely in the office together. Yeah. So I think in, in ski areas, it's just a matter of time and, and money, unfortunately. But it's probably an important part of the, the, the whole... Uh, the way to, to really do this right if, that we're missing. That by debriefing and figuring on these days when you are operating in narrow margin environments or you know compressed margins, you really need to stop and look, okay, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? Where did we get lucky that nothing happened? So you cannot make these mistakes, even though you're not being punished for them. You, you make them every day, just usually you don't get in trouble for making mistakes in that large train. It's rare that we do. But debrief whenever you can. Uh, even when nothing goes wrong, have some sort of a meeting. It will probably go a long ways. And then the, the can-do attitude that controllers have. It's like, all right, let's get out there. we got to open it up today. You know, it's blowing 80 and just snowed four feet. It, it can be problematic, especially with the, the never-ending quest that skiers have to open more and more gnarly terrain. That, uh, that can
can do attitude is you have to have it somewhat or the stuff would never get open. But it can you can take it too far and it can get us in trouble. So be wary of that. Um, another way, switching gears a little from this will be my last little spiel. So this is a place called Flixborough. It's a chemical plant over in England. In 1974, they had a bad accident here. and ended up killing 28 people. Um, a guy named Trevor Kletz, after that, who is a process safety engineer. What is a process safety engineer? Basically, they, they look at process plants, which are chemical plants, refineries, pharmaceuticals, where they're manufacturing things, where there's a, a manufacturing process. And he looked at this and at this uh, incident in particular, this is back in the 80s, and uh, I remember actually hearing a lecture about this when I was in college. I was a chemical engineering major for a few years, so I figured out I didn't want to build oil refineries. And, uh, but it kind of stuck with me, so a year ago I started kind of looking into this again, revisiting it. And he wrote an article called, uh, oh God, What You Don't Have Can't Leak. And the theory, <laughs> it was great though, is that, that article then led to a book which has kind of revolutionized uh, its really innovative approach to process safety engineering where typically uh, the way that people looked at it prior to this accident was, okay, we're going to have this process, we're going to mix this chemical with this, and if something goes wrong, we'll build a bigger wall or a thicker wall to make sure that no one gets hurt. So we'll try to minimize the consequences. Kind of like uh, we would de design better avalanche beacons, or avalons, or things like that, or more, more of that side of the process. So if we look at what we do, that's what I'm, I'm trying to make that shift. We're going to look at what we do as more of a process. Uh, it's a little bit of a jump. But what he came up with was uh, what he called inherently safe process or inherently safer design. And what an inherently safe process or design one, it has a low level of danger, even if things go wrong. So instead of having those, those chemicals, instead of worrying about building a thicker wall, he's saying, why don't we keep them separate or not do that thing that creates the hazard in the first place, rather than build a stronger wall to deal with it. It also avoids hazards entirely, instead of controlling them or minimizing their consequences. So right there, kind of what I was talking about. And I think where we can make this jump a little bit to a, to avalanche mitigation programs, can we use that, the same methods, to improve our process safety when we're faced with narrow margins? And, and I think, you know, maybe we can, maybe we can't, but just in general, as an industry, we need to look at what these really well-funded, wealthy industries have done to deal with their safety issues, and whenever we can, copy them. Because we don't have the money to have, you know, these guys are spending probably, you know, millions to billions a year on improving plant safety for these processes, where we don't spend that much money. Um, so the four main methods with uh, inherent safe processes, or inherently safe designs, minimize, and I'll say that with, with avalanche, maybe what we can do is minimize the personnel in areas, increase our spacing. So we're minimizing where we have people, rather than having five people in the same area going off the top of the summit of Lone Peak like we did in 1995-96. That incident led to the creation of the Snow Safety Department that gave Mike and I jobs as forecasters and changed things dramatically about where where routes go, how things work, and really educate. But maybe what we need to do is when we have when we reach these thresholds where we know we're in this narrow margin environment, we need to say all right, when we're under these conditions, we, we have a separate set of operating protocols or procedures, and they need to be hard and fast rules, because if you leave gray areas, people are going to make poor decisions and not follow them. If you leave them the option, they're inevitably going to. But uh, you say, okay, this route doesn't go out, you leave an extra gap. And you say, that route, they never leave the ridge. They don't go down and check out what they have for results. They're on the ridge, end of story. Things like that. Um, substitute. Maybe substitute mitigation methods. Use trams. Use launchers. Use alternate methods of delivery. Stay up on ridges where you just dangle shots below where you're not traveling in starting zones. Do things where you can avoid, where you can just substitute that, that hazard. Moderate. Um, this one's a little bit of a stretch, but just environmental challenges. We need to be cognizant of that. 
that if it's just really gnarly outside, you know, wait for the conditions to moderate. And then simplify. Simplify our routes and procedures. And that's a big one that uh, in this industry that inherently safer design. Simplification is huge. If you can find a way that you're not doing kick turns after you're throwing shots, you're not moving after you're doing shots, and you're not having to get out of your skis and walk over the edge and huck it way down as far over the road as you can. A few things to simplify that process. And the hard part for us is going to be determining when we switch from inherently safer or to inherently safer processes from our standard processes and then, like I said, developing firm guidelines and protocols. I don't know if it's even possible because you can't say, well, we want you to do this so everyone will be a little safer. That's kind of what we're doing now, but obviously it's not working because people are getting caught and people are dying still. So we, hopefully we can figure out a way to stop that trend that's going on. So wrapping it up, we definitely need some more data and information sharing. If, uh, if we don't have a way to, to talk about these incidents and have more than six, you know, ideally you have a big pool of these to really learn from, and it's going to be really hard to, to draw conclusions. They're always going to be the outlier events, no matter what. It's going to be really hard to forecast some of these weird things. It needs to be better at recognizing narrowing margins, try to figure out what we can do to, to recognize these situations, either right before they're occurring or right when they're starting. Speak up as individuals, control teams, and organizations in these environments, like Jordy said, you know, break that chain while you're in the middle of it. Don't let it become an accident. And then consider adapting programs from other industries. And I'll just leave it with this. The only rule of thumb, because there is no rule of thumb for us, the only rule of thumb in Avalanche work is that there is no rule of thumb for Ron Perla. Some wise words. That's all I have to say about that. Very specific questions, otherwise I think a lot of them will probably get flushed out in, a, in the panel discussions and maybe we can take